Hello lovely internet strangers. This is the first video I am posting on my channel in 2022, a brand new year, a year filled with untapped potential and promise. I am optimistic about the quality of the year to come. However, today I'm going to discuss something that is not of quality, which is this YA book that I just finished reading. And the reason that I want to talk about it is because it's the perfect example of exactly what I was afraid of finding when I started reading YA novels again. So to give you some context. Most of you know that I used to work in publishing and I worked a lot with science fiction, fantasy, and also young adult novels. That is what YA stands for, young adult. It is not a genre, it is a category. There's YA romance, sci-fi, fantasy. Every genre that exists in adult fiction exists in young adult as well. When I was a teenager, I read YA novels religiously and I continued to read them through my college years and beyond. Contrary to popular belief, there is just as much quality within the YA category as within in the other categories. That is to say, there are a lot of really great books, there are a lot of mediocre books, and a lot of bad books, just like you'll find in adult literary fiction, science fiction and fantasy, crime, mystery, etc. I was really passionate about YA. I would recommend books to people all the time. Even my dad and my uncle found books to love in the young adult category. However, as my tenure in publishing went on, I started to notice that the YA books that were being sold had a worrying pattern, which is that a lot of the descriptions of these books were focused not on an actual story, but on the identity categories of the characters or on a message. So essentially the pitch for the book would be, these characters are trans, this is a feminist novel. And I'd be like, okay, but like, what is it about? What is the trans character going through? Are they like competing in a scavenger hunt? Are they going to a summer camp? Are they going on a road trip? What is happening? People would essentially just take existing stories cliches and be like, but now they're gay, but now they're a woman instead of a man, now they're trans, etc. Or there was just a lot of emphasis on this character is Latina. And I'd be like, okay, like I don't just want to read a book because they're Latina. So I pretty much stopped reading young adult novels toward the end of my tenure in publishing, not really because of the trend that I was seeing, but mostly just because I was reading so much fiction for work that I didn't have the bandwidth left to read fiction in my personal life. And because I was going on my intellectual journey at that time, it made sense for me to read a lot of nonfiction and just consume a lot of videos and articles. But eventually I got back into reading fiction and I've read things here or there, but I finally really wanted to get back into reading YA, particularly YA that had been written in the past few years because I potentially would like to write a YA novel of my own and I needed to see what was out there. But I was really worried about the wokeness pervading YA these days because as I would look for lists of upcoming YA books, I would just see those lists being dominated by exactly what was annoying me when I worked in publishing. But with my recent foray into YA, I actually got really lucky and I found a couple of books that I really, really liked and the other ones were fine, enjoyable reads, and there really wasn't any wokeness to be found. And a couple of these have been published in the last couple of years. And then I found this book and I was like, this is exactly what I was trying to avoid. And the only reason I finished the book was because I'm essentially doing research for my own novel and so I wanted to see how this author wrapped up the plot. So I don't have a physical copy of the book to hold up because I read this via library ebook, but I bookmarked all the parts that I wanted to rant about and I have not looked at them again since I finished the book so that I could have a somewhat fresh reaction while discussing them. So the book is called Today, Tonight, Tomorrow by Rachel Lynn Solomon. The book was published in 2020, so it's pretty recent, and I was primed to like this book. The reason that I had marked this book to read was because the events of the book take place over 24 hours, which is a trope that I love. It involves this game that's a cross between a scavenger hunt and assassin, and I was like, yep, check. And the overall premise is a rivals to lovers romance, which I also love. So I was like, ready for this book to at least be enjoyable. I wasn't expecting it to be the most amazing book I've ever read. I just thought it'd be an enjoyable, fun read. No. <laughs> This book was not very good. So right from the get-go, on the second page of this novel, at least in the ebook form, the main female character, Rowan, narrates, In his mind, the only thing you're supposed to feel while reading a book is a sense of superiority. He's the kind of person who believes all real literature, capitalized, has already been written by dead white men. If he could, he'd bring Hemingway back to life for one last cocktail, smoke a cigar with Fitzgerald, dissect the nature of human existence with Steinbeck. Arrest this man for wanting to hang out with 
with great authors of the past because they happen to be white and men. And this is obviously the only reason we still study them. It couldn't be that the works have some merit on their own. So this is a key part of how their rivalry started, okay? She says, Our rivalry dates back to freshman year when a small panel of judges declared his essay the winner of a school-wide contest about the book that had impacted us the most. I came in second. McNair, in all his originality, picked The Great Gatsby. I picked Vision in White, my favorite Nora Roberts, a choice he scoffed at even after he'd won, insinuating I shouldn't have gotten second place for picking a romance novel. This was clearly a really valid stance for someone who'd likely never read one. And she's despised him ever since. Cool, 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 awesome. This makes a lot of sense. It's the last day of school and Rowan, the Nora Roberts lover, is walking around and runs into her favorite teacher, Miss Grable. And Rowan narrates, Miss Grable, who must only be in her late 20s, ensured our reading list was majority women and authors of color. I loved her. And I'm just like, give me a break. I don't care. I don't need this line. Like, it's so annoying because the people who push for that stuff are always the people that say, oh, Oh, why is this list majority men and white men? Okay, so you want to balance it out? No, we don't want to balance it out. We want to flip it so it's majority women and authors of color. Screw you guys. We'll make sure it's majority women and authors of color, even if they happen to be not the most well-known works that, you know, someone should study when they're trying to get a broad education and this sort of thing. I study the Harlem Renaissance in college. Obviously, all the authors there are going to be majority authors of color. In fact, they're going to be 100% authors authors of color. But let's not get caught in the weeds. There are plenty more moments for me to pick out and discuss. So Rowan had this success guide that she wrote for herself when she was 14. And she's looking at it and going, oh, I haven't lived up to it, blah, blah, blah. And number seven on the list says, go to prom with your PHSB, which stands for perfect high school boyfriend, and Kirby and Mara. Find a fantastic dress, rent a limo, eat at a fancy restaurant. The whole John Hughes experience minus the toxic masculinity. And I'm just like, okay, if I was not reading this book for research to see what's out there and to see how this author pulled this whole thing together, I would be so out. I already wanted to be out, but now on page 50 out of 411, I really, really wanted to be out. And of course, number 10 is destroy Neil McNair, make him regret ever writing that great Gatsby essay and everything he's done since then. Yes, this boy transgressed against you so hard when he wrote about the book that impacted him the most, and it happened to be a different one than you, and he made fun of you for the book that you chose. Get a grip, girl. Okay, three pages later, Later, she's talking to her friends, Kirby and Mara, about her rivalry with Neil. One of her friends says, I'll never forget that student council meeting last year that lasted until midnight. Mr. Travers couldn't get you two to wrap it up. I thought he was going to cry. I forgot about that. We've been trying to reach a conclusion about allocating funds for the upcoming year. McNair insisted the English department needed new copies of A White Man in Peril. Okay, the books have real titles, but that's what they're all about. While I argue we should use the money for books by women and authors of color. They're not classics, McNair had said. I might have lazily fired back your face isn't a classic. In my defense, it was late. Needless to say, it got a little out of hand. And I'm like, okay, so books by women and authors of color are all so original and about amazing different things than someone in peril. Isn't it just a woman in peril or a person of color in peril? All the basic story archetypes have been around forever. You can swap out the identity category of the person who's in that situation, but let's not act like women and authors of color are inherently writing stories that are at their base so different from the ones that men have been writing because aren't we all just the same, right? Like, aren't we all just human beings? So don't we have the same experiences? Or is it like, oh, we're women and we're different and we're people of color and we're different and we have to write our experiences. Like, which one am I supposed to be like following? Like, give me the metric, explain it. Are you saying that men and women are identical? No, oh, no, of course not. Women are unique in every way. No, he's saying women and men aren't equal. No, no, no. It's the differences of which there are none that make the sameness exceptional. Just tell me what to say. <laughs> So then our two main characters are waiting to hear who is going to be the valedictorian. It's about to be announced at a school assembly. Rowan is being introduced by the administrator or teacher or whatever and is described thusly. She'll be an undecided freshman at Emerson College in Boston. Here at Westview, she's been captain of our quiz bowl team, editor of the yearbook, taken a total of 12 AP classes and served on student council all four years. As co-president, she campaigned for all gender restrooms and she was also responsible for helping the school 
will become a little greener. We now compost and have a trash sorting system thanks to Rowan. So she's pretty much exactly the kind of character you would expect based on what we have seen so far, which is that she doesn't have much of a personality. She's just like, I am against white men books. I think romance novels are good. I am an overachiever and I must beat this man because he once wronged me by winning an essay contest with the kind of book that I find offensive. So here's where I started getting really annoyed. Like not just from the like, okay, this is woke, this is annoying perspective, but from like a bad storytelling perspective. So at this point, the last day of school has ended and everyone has run off to play Howl, which is a game that the juniors organize for the seniors every year. It's a scavenger hunt plus assassin. So you have to find all the clues, but you also have to avoid being killed by having your bandana pulled by the person who has your target. But she's just gotten the list of clues. She's just gone off by herself to play this game. And instead of like getting to the chase, she sits in this coffee shop and is thinking about this romance author who Who's coming into town, how she really wants to go to the reading, but like nobody in her life knows that she likes romance novels. Not even her parents who are this author illustrator team who write these children's books that are really popular. They don't even know that she wants to write because like everyone that she knows, every time she's talked about romance novels, they think that they're stupid and this girl can't stand up for herself or whatever. So she's sitting in this coffee shop and has this inner monologue that is clearly for the benefit of the person reading the book and like makes no sense as just like an inner monologue. So referring to this this romance author she's hoping to see at this book signing, she says, I've rehearsed a hundred times how to tell her what romance novels mean to me, and yet I'm still worried I'll get tongue-tied. I found my first one, Anora Roberts, at a yard sale when I was 10, a bit too young to understand what was really happening in some of the scenes. After speeding through everything the school librarian recommended, I wanted something a little more adult, and this definitely was. My parents humored me letting me get that book. They thought it was funny, and they encouraged me to ask if I had any questions. I had a lot of questions, but I wasn't sure where to start. Over the years, romance novels became both escapist and empowering. Especially as I got older, my heart would race during the sex scenes, most of which I read in bed with my door locked, after I said goodnight to my parents and was sure I wouldn't be interrupted. They were thrilling and educational, if occasionally unrealistic. Can a guy really have five orgasms in a single night? I'm still not sure. Not all romance novels had sex scenes, but they made me comfortable talking about sex and consent and birth control with my parents and with my friends. I hoped they'd make me confident with my boyfriends too, but Spencer and I clearly had communication issues, and with Luke, everything was so new that I didn't know how to articulate what I wanted. But then my parents started asking questions like, you're still reading those? And wouldn't you rather read something with a little more substance? Most movies and shows I watched with my friends showed me that women were sex objects, accessories, plot points. The books I read proved they were wrong. Like, where do I even, like, I just can't. I just like wanted to throw this book against a wall, but I'd be throwing my e-reader against a wall. And I don't want to do that because I love my e-reader. It's just fundamentally wrong that most movies and shows show that women are sex objects, accessories, and plot points. If this character is supposed to be 18 in 2020, that means she was born in 2002. And that means that like by the time she was 13 or so, then like she was watching stuff in 2015. And I'm sorry, but like TV at that point and movies at that point had plenty of main female characters and characters not just being sex objects and plot points. So I don't know WTF she's talking about. This just reads like the author herself who's probably older, taking out some grudge against the media of her youth, even though I don't think it was true then either. So... She continues this inner monologue. It's not over. It's a comfort knowing each book will end tied up with a neat bow. More than that, the characters burrowed into my heart. I got invested in their stories, followed them across series as they flirted and fought and fell in love. I swooned when they wound up at a hotel with only one room, which of course contained only one bed. I learned to love love in all its forms, and I wanted it desperately for myself, to write about it, to live it. I am sick of being alone in my love for romance novels. This is why I want, need to meet Delilah tonight. Other people read and love these books too, and I have to see them in real life to believe it. Maybe some of their confidence will rub off on me. And I'm like, who are you talking to? Like, I have spent a lot of time reading YA novels with first person narration, and this is not how you do it. I'm just sorry. Like, why is there this info dump about romance novels and like your entire history with them? Like, you're not talking to anyone and explaining it. And she's not doing it in a manner where she's like reflecting on things. Ugh, it's just so, like, it just takes me out of like the entire book. Okay, so then she's into 
interrupted from this asinine internal monologue by her ex-boyfriend showing up. And he's just like an annoying subplot that doesn't need to be there at all. And they're talking and she didn't really know like why he broke up with her or whatever. And at one point he says, you want this idealized romance and I don't think that's real life. I'm pretty sure all relationships get boring after a while, which is true, but boring doesn't mean bad. Relationships do get boring, but like comforting. So main character goes into her inner monologue and thinks to herself, it's in that moment that pity is the overwhelming thing I feel. I feel sorry for this troglodyte because he has no idea that love doesn't have to sour over time. I don't need to be whisked away in a horse-drawn carriage. And I fully believe both partners are responsible for making a relationship romantic if that's what they want. Not whatever heteronormative bullshit that tells us guys are supposed to make the first move and pay for dinner and get down on one knee. I'm sorry, did you just think heteronormative bullshit in your inner monologue? Like, I'm done. I'm out. I jumped out the window and fell 15 stories. But no, I kept reading this book because, again, for the research. And at that point, I was like, I could probably make a video about this. So here we are. Okay, so during the editing process, I realized that I had forgotten to comment on one particular line from the book, which was possibly the most egregious line in the entire book. But I had forgotten to bookmark it. I had only taken a screenshot and I discovered it as I was cleaning out some photos on my phone. So I have put the photo on screen just to further provide evidence that I did not make this up. And because there is no video for this portion, I'm adding this here in the video because I don't remember exactly where it went in the timeline of the book, but I think it was around here. So the main character Rowan says, while I love romance, I've never believed in the concept of soulmates, which has always seemed a little like men's rights activism, not a real thing. And I was like, honey, you need to take a step back. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I was reading. It was like the stereotype come to life. It was exactly what I was afraid I was gonna find when I got back into reading YA. And here it was in front of me on the page. A line like this will severely date this book in even just a few years from now. But worst of all, the line just doesn't make any sense because sure, you can be opposed to men's rights activists like most feminists are, but they're real. The whole reason Chanty Binks, aka Big Red, blew up in the meme sphere back in the day was because she was arguing with men's rights activists outside of an event that they had at U Toronto. That's just the facts, ma'am. And yet teen girls will read this and be like, ah yes, men's rights activism, not a real thing. Amazing. All right, back to your regularly scheduled video. Okay, so then we have this like subplot about her being Jewish. So I'm not Jewish. A couple of my closest friends are Jewish and I've known plenty of Jewish people throughout my life. And I understand the history of the Jewish people and of anti-Semitism in different times and places. And I know that anti-Semitism is still a thing. And I have no problem with an author wanting to write about an experience that they've had with anti-Semitism or like bring this into the story. But you have to like write write a story. You have to integrate. You have to show us. But it's never really part of the plot. It's just like this info dumping thing that happens. Later, her being Jewish kind of becomes part of what connects her to this guy, and I'll get to that. But our first encounter with it, for the most part, is her overhearing this chick who is jealous that her and McNair always get the top two spots and wants to beat them at this game. And so this chick is like conspiring against them or whatever. And the girl makes a comment that she doesn't really need the money because main character is Jewish and she like taps her nose. I mean, like, I'm sure that kind of thing happens in 2020. Maybe Seattle has rampant anti-Semitism among its high school students. I don't really know. I've never lived in Seattle. But then main character goes on this whole thing where she just like explains being Jewish and anti-Semitism. So her inner monologue goes as follows. I curl one hand around the plant's fake bark in an attempt to anchor myself. In bluest blue Blue Seattle, a place everyone claims to be so open, this still happens. The jabs people think are harmless, the stereotypes they accept as truth. There aren't many Jews here. In fact, I can name every other Jewish kid at Westview, all four of us. When you're Jewish, you learn from a young age that you can either go along with the jokes or fight back and risk much worse because you don't have the words yet to tell anyone why those jokes aren't funny. I chose option A. It makes me sick sometimes thinking about how I egged people on in elementary school because if you can't beat them, join them, right? I run my index finger along the bump of bone in the middle of my nose. In fourth grade, I failed an 
eye exam on purpose, hoping glasses would detract from the monstrosity in the middle of my face, but I felt so guilty about it that I ultimately confessed to my parents. Even now, it's not my favorite feature. One comment and it drags me all the way back to that place where I hated looking at myself. So that part wasn't like that annoying. I was like, okay, fine. You're like explaining to us that even in Seattle, people are still like this and this has affected you and this is how you handled it, okay? So then she runs into McNair and she's trying to explain to him about the plot against them. And then she almost tells them about the anti-Semitic remark, but decides not to. But then I break off, realizing I was about to tell him how she tapped her nose. I'm not sure I can explain to someone who isn't Jewish, who's never experienced this, how equating Judaism with wealth is anti-Semitic. Centuries ago, Jews weren't allowed to own land and could only make a living as merchants and bankers. It evolved into a stereotype that we're not just rich, but greedy too. And then she continues. And I was like, I have a weird feeling about you like explaining what anti-Semitism is to people. Like if they don't know, like, are you really helping the world by like explaining in this kind of like ham-fisted way, like inserting into the novel randomly? Like, by the way, this is how you be anti-Semitic. There are stereotypes about us. So here you go. You didn't know what the stereotypes are before, but now you do. So I guess you can avoid them or you could play into them because you didn't know. Like obviously the chick Savannah she's talking about knows what the stereotypes are and she's playing on them in her comments to the kids that she's talking to. And I'm not sure how helpful it is to tell the teen audience she thinks she's writing to about this. Although I don't know if she's really writing to a teen audience or if she's writing to an audience of people that are like her and of her age. This is something I think I've touched on before maybe in a previous video where I feel like YA has gotten ruined by people not actually writing for a teen audience or even a general audience that wants to read about these experiences, but writing to this like ideological in-group or like this particular age range that's like similar to them and will be like, yeah, good, you put that message out there. And again, if this was like integrated into the story and I felt like it mattered, that would be different. But the way that it does get integrated into the story is like a total kind of deus ex machina, like doesn't really make sense to me kind of a thing. Like it's too convenient. So put a pin in that. Okay, so because of the plot against them, she proposes that they team up. She says, well, they'll split the money 50-50 when he asks kind of what's in it for him. And then he wants to up the stakes. And because they're nerds, they end up deciding that the loser has to write a book report on a book of the winner's choosing, which makes sense because as you will remember, she has a lot of opinions about literature and the kind of literature that he likes. And he says, as weird as it is to talk about book reports on the last day of school, it's kind of perfect. The only question is, should it be the old man in the sea or great expectations? Or wait, I'd love to see what you do with war and peace, unabridged, naturally. And she retorts, so many mediocre white men to choose from. And I'm just like... Can I get a break? Like, you're just so pleasant to be around. I can't tolerate it. Okay, so at one point they're walking around looking for clues, etc. And McNair wants to ask Rowan a question. And he asks, why do you hate me so much? And she explains that she doesn't hate him. He just frustrates her. And I'm like, okay, you told us before that you despise this person, but whatever. And she says it's more than just because she wants to be the best and they're rivals or whatever. Most of what we talk about is completely harmless, but you've never been able to stop with the snide remark about romance novels. And that's not teasing to me. It just hurts. And he says, I'm so sorry. I really thought, I really thought we were just teasing each other. And he genuinely sounds sorry. And main character replies with this rant, it doesn't feel like teasing when you go out of your way to make me feel like garbage for liking what I like. I already have to defend it enough with my parents and with my friends. Like I get it. Ha ha. Sometimes there are shirtless men on the covers, but what I'll never understand is why people are so quick to trash this one thing that's always been for women first. They won't let us have this one thing that isn't hurting anyone and makes us happy. Nope. If you like romance, romance novels, you have zero taste or you're a lonely spinster. And I'm like, can you get over yourself? I get it. Some people don't like romance novels. They make fun of people for liking them. But let's not act like women haven't made fun of men for a long time for liking comics or liking video games or sci-fi and fantasy books for a long time. Pulp fiction back in the day. Anything else that they like. Lots of people have strong opinions about what's good to read and what's not good to read. And some people crap on other people for what they like. You're 18. You're going off to college. Grow 
up. And like, fine if that's what the character is like and that's how she feels, but the way she communicates it is very much like the author just being like, hey people out there who judge romance novels, here's an explanation of why you shouldn't judge romance novels. I have a chip on my shoulder about it in case you didn't know. I'm gonna explain it to you. And I'm just like, wow, I really feel like I'm reading dialogue between two characters and not the author trying to convey her message. Okay, another little throwaway moment. Rowan and McNair go meet up with one of McNair's friends who's going to help them with a broken cell phone. Welcome to my laboratory, Sean says in a voice that makes him sound like a villain in a spy movie that definitely doesn't pass the Bechdel test. Like, why? What value did this add to the story? Nothing, except to further characterize your character as a walking, woke stereotype who has no personality. She really has no personality. It's really bad. And a bit further on, when they're still at Sean's place, McNair says, Says, multitasking is a myth. Our brains can only focus on one high level task at a time. It's why you can drive and listen to music at the same time, but you couldn't take a test and listen to a podcast simultaneously. And Sean says, no mansplaining in my lab, please. I wasn't Neil starts, Neil's McNair in case you forgot. But then he goes silent as though realizing that's exactly what he was doing. Like for real though, like for real, for real, is this how we want to write books? Is this what entertains? Am I alone in the universe? And then toward the end of when they're at Sean's place, we have this amazing moment. Neil places a hand on Sean's shoulder. My kingdom for more guys who can express physical affection without needing to justify their masculinity afterward. The comet has nothing to do with anything. She's not saying it out loud to them so they can like respond to it. She's just thinking it. And then they just move on with the interaction. Like the guys are talking and I'm sitting here going, why, why? Why? Maybe guys don't want to express physical affection the way that girls do. Maybe that's okay. Maybe you should accept differences. Maybe you should let them be. <sighs> okay, moving on. And then we find out a third of the way through the book that she actually had a crush on him before she despised him, but her crush was then destroyed by that essay contest. It's fine if the guy doesn't know that she had a crush, but like it's first person narration and she basically told us her entire history with this guy, but she never mentioned that she used to have a crush and then the essay contest happened and her dreams of the perfect romance were destroyed. Like, hello, that was missing information. She just tells it to him to make him feel better when he's like having a rough moment because, you know, the whole point of this book is that they're supposed to stop being rivals and, you know, get together. So that's starting to happen. And he says that she was cool back then. Aside from your inability to acknowledge The Great Gatsby as a quintessential American novel. And Rowan replies, ah, yes, the Great Gatsby, a feminist text. Come on, girl, let's come up with some better dialogue, some less ideological dialogue. So then McNair and Rowan have another interaction where he finds out that her parents don't know that she read romance novels. And he says, my mom likes them, if that helps at all. And Rowan replies, I hope you don't ever give her shit for them. He grimaces, not anymore. Girl, this is why you never had your perfect high school romance or really any good romance because you are annoying. You need to get a grip on reality. You need to learn how to have a dialogue. Dialogue. So remember the whole Jewish thing from before. And I was like, cool, if you want to like integrate your experiences with anti-Semitism, that's fine. But like make it part of the plot, like make it matter. Don't just make it this like throwaway thing that you threw in there somewhere. And so the way she decides to integrate it into the plot sort of is that 76% of the way through, she finds out that McNair is secretly Jewish. People can't tell because he has like red hair and stuff. His mom is Jewish. So he is Jewish according to the Jewish people. But I guess his dad was the one with the red hair. So then she's like looking at him. I examine him as though looking for some obvious Jewishness I missed. Of course there isn't any, just his objectively cute face. I usually have this instant connection with other Jews. It's happened my entire life, despite how few Jews I know. Neil McNair is Jewish and there's that tug in my chest, the one I feel when I learn I share a religion with someone. Faulty Judar, he asks? Guess so. It's the last name too, but it's his dad's. We haven't found out his secret dark backstory with his dad, which is like annoying. So then she like invites him to dinner with her parents because they love having Jews over and they don't get to do it enough, yada, yada, yada. So then it becomes this like bonding point between them. How convenient that this guy that you've known for four years and been rivals with, like you never found out that he was Jewish ever and he just happens to be Jewish and you find it out during the course of this last day that you guys are spending together. Now you're like, I feel bonded because we share the same religion. You thought he was like annoying and frustrating 
being and you even despised him, but okay, he's Jewish. I mean, at this point, she's like growing to care for him and yada, yada, yada. But like nothing ever really happens with the Jewish thing. She kind of lets that girl know at the end that she heard her anti-Semitic comment and kind of makes the girl sheepish about it. And I'm like, okay, I just didn't feel like it added anything to the novel. And it's fine. Like you don't have to always have like a big message about someone's identity category. Sometimes people are just Jewish and they exist and they are a character in a novel. But like that wasn't the approach she took. She made it this whole like message about explaining like anti-Semitism and the history of the Jewish people and the connection, yada, yada, yada. But like ultimately, like it didn't really matter. There wasn't some part of the plot that was like really impacted. Like it was cool for her that she discovered that he was Jewish or whatever, but it didn't like help them figure out one of the clues for the scavenger hunt. But it was like so in your face as to be unavoidable. Maybe for Jewish women of a certain demographic, they read this and they're like, I feel so seen by this. If that's the case, good for you. But like, if I'm gonna write a book where the character is Latina, Latino, and I'm gonna make a big point about, you know, like anti-Latino discrimination, like I'm gonna make it an integral part of the plot and be a thing that like has consequence. That's just me personally, and that's what I prefer. But that didn't happen in this book. Okay, so then we get to this part where McNair is talking about his dad who's like in prison and like that never really matters that much either. And it's just kind of like a lot of telling, not showing. And he's talking about his dad and says, it was clear I didn't exactly fit his description of what a man should be. In his mind, there were boy hobbies and there were girl hobbies. And most of what I liked fit into the latter category. It was a crime that I wasn't interested in sports. And if he knew I was getting emotional about this and I'm just like rolling my eyes, I don't have a problem with like this general plot point, but I've just seen it done so much better. I just read Eleanor and Park not too long ago. And one of the main plot points is that the male main character Park has this kind of tense relationship with his dad because his dad has a certain idea about how boys should act and be and dress and Park doesn't always fit that. And he tries not to provoke his dad by being too different, but then he starts to and there's kind of a silence between them. And so like you see that, you see it portrayed. Whereas in this novel, they're just like, oh, and by the way, my dad and I were like this, boy hobbies and girl hobbies. Like it's talking to the reader. It's like thinking that there's boy hobbies and girl hobbies is bad. And that makes McNair's dad bad. And this is how we're signaling it. And also reminding you not to be gender normative, you bad person. I must spread the word. Okay, so then she's at his house when he was telling her about his dad. They're in his bedroom and she sees this book on his shelf in the back and she's like, what's that? And he says, nothing. But I'm reaching for the familiar cover, The Woman in a Wedding Dress, Vision in White by Nora Roberts, the romance novel I wrote about freshman year. Huh, isn't this interesting? My grin cannot be contained. He fists a hand in his hair. I, uh, got it used later in freshman year. I thought maybe I'd been a bit of a dick about it. I figured maybe you were onto something. Maybe I should read it if I was going to pass such harsh judgment on it. It's the way so many people talk about romance novels right? I was young and I guess I thought it was cool to make fun of things I didn't really understand. I wanted to give it a chance. And what did you think? I liked it, he admits. It was well written and it was funny. It was easy to get invested in the characters. I could see why you loved it. Okay, I'm sorry. I remember being a teenage girl. I was friends with a lot of teenage boys and I do not buy this dialogue for a second. Like maybe he got the romance novel, maybe he read it, but just like this stilted, clearly for the benefit of the reader, like look, look at this teenage boy who read a romance novel and realized I was wrong. I was young. Okay, no like senior boy in high school talks about being a freshman in high school. Like, ah, oh, I was young and dumb. Like really? You're 32 looking back on your youth? Come on. I just like could not even with that whole interaction. Okay, so we have another section where she goes on about Judaism when McNair comes over for dinner. This dinner scene goes on and on. They're still in the middle of this like scavenger hunt and they get that they're detouring to the dinner and he's like meeting her parents, cute, cute, bonding over Judaism. But this scene just goes on and on because she's just explaining all these things about being Jewish. Neil says, it's strange being one of only a few Jewish kids in class and Rowan has this internal monologue. Most of the year, 
or you don't notice it makes you different. It's just what your family does every Friday, and we don't completely unplug like some more observant Jews, but during the entire months of November and December, you're a complete outsider. So many people never realize that someone doesn't by default celebrate Christmas. And then she shares this anecdote about a teacher in fifth grade putting up a Christmas tree before remembering that she was the only Jew in the class, and then announced to the entire class because she didn't want to offend her, she was taking it down, yada yada, and her parents are like, oh, you never told us. And I'm going, oh my lord, can we get on with this scene? If this character had a personality that I could grab onto or like sketch for you, I'd be like, cool, I'm happy for her that she like found a Jewish person that she could like be friends with and bond with. But like, she basically doesn't have a personality other than being academically intense, liking romance novels and wanting to write one, talking about being Jewish and anti-Semitism. And there's also a part where she's like kind of an oblivious, crappy friend. I just, I hated this character. I did not care if she won the contest or if she got together with this guy. Like, I really just didn't care. So this boy loves children's books, which her parents write. He's like a huge fan, so he geeks out with them. Because of course, he's a woke teenage boy who isn't afraid to admit that he likes his children's book series enough still when he's 18 to like fanboy about it. Okay, fine. And then because he knows now about Rowan's chip on her shoulder about romance novels, he says to her parents that he also loves romance novels. And her dad says, I guess they're not just for bored housewives anymore. And Neil says, and not just for women either, though they center women's experiences in a way little other media does. I can't, I cannot even, my ability to can has left the damn building. And her dad says, well, I don't know if that's necessarily true, and rattles off the names of a few Netflix shows because, of course, three recent examples are incontrovertible proof that an entire art form isn't still majorly skewed toward the male gaze. I cannot. Like, I could focus my entire channel on just talking about shows and movies from across time that feature women as main characters, as not just sex objects, as characters with agency, as characters that are badass, and so on and so on. But no, there's only three examples, and he found all of them as his proof that misogynistic pig of a father you have. Oh, I totally skipped over the part where after he made that comment, she thought to herself, Dad, your misogyny is showing. Again, leave. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. So then at some point after the dinner, they have another exchange where he's thanking her for inviting him. And he talks about his experiences like he had with the teacher. People tell you to lighten up, that you're overreacting, or they seem that way at first. And then it's one joke after another. And you start wondering if you really are lesser because of it. That's why I stopped telling people. And with my last name, no one assumed. And she's like, don't you love when people call it the holidays or a holiday party, but everything's red and green and there's a fucking Santa and they have a whole conversation about that and I'm like, okay. And the thing is, my main problem with the way that this dialogue slogs along is that like maybe if this is a different kind of book, it wouldn't be so bad with like the pacing and everything, but they're on this scavenger hunt. They're on this assassin slash scavenger hunt where like at any moment someone could be coming up trying to steal their armband, they could be out of the game, they're in a race against other people to find the clues first and yet they find the time to like have have all these meandering conversations about Judaism or about how important it is that people understand that romance novels center women's experiences or whatever. And I'm just like, but I'm here for the scavenger hunt. Like you can discover these things, but you have to move the plot along. You have to follow the plot. Like I just, I can't. She tells him about a bomb threat someone called in before her bat mitzvah. And then he info dumps in this manner. But it's weird sometimes with my last name and then with the hair and the freckles, the assumption is that I'm fully Irish. I pass as non-Jewish until someone learns I'm Jewish, and then they refer to it all the time. People here go out of their way to try to make you feel comfortable, and by doing that, they sometimes alienate you even more. Some of them mean well, but others... Dude, I'm the product of Puerto Rican and Polish parents. Everyone assumes that I'm just white, I'm Polish. They're like, oh, that explains it. I'm like, no, Puerto Ricans, you know, look like me, even full Puerto Ricans. However, I'm not going to convey that sentiment by having one character be like, hey, other character, let me info dump my experience to you instead of like showing this experience happening. And like, I get that it's not that easy to do in the context of the story that she's writing, but she already managed to show, for example, that one class 
classmate making the anti-Semitic comment. At least we had that instead of all the info dumping. But again, I'm sitting here like we have had pages of these two going back and forth. First we had pages of the dinner, then we had pages of them just standing here having this conversation. And I'm like, why? Why? Okay, so sometimes they have these historical text exchanges between the two of them. And there's this one that's a group chat when they're supposed to work on some group project. And she says to him, you don't have to be a dick just because we're not reading your bro, Mark Twain. McNair replies, he's not my bro. And every other sophomore English class is reading Huck Finn this year. Forgive me if I was looking forward to it. And Rowan replies, I can't imagine looking forward to blatant racism and misogyny, but you do you. And some other girl in the group chat says, is every conversation going to be like this? And McNair says, no. And Rowan says, yes. And then it says, Neil McNair has left the chat. I'm like, yes, this is not just every group chat conversation, but every conversation with this girl is like this. Another conversation they have, McNair says, why should we feel guilty about something that brings us pleasure? Talking about the concept of a guilty pleasure. And Rowan replies, yes, exactly. And it's usually things that women and teens or kids like. Can't just agree. Can't just leave it at like, yes, the concept of a guilty pleasure is kind of stupid and we should just like what we like and be okay with talking about it. No, it has to be things that women and teens or kids like because of course it does. No one ever makes fun of men for things that they like ever. Okay, so after she makes this comment, McNair replies, not everything. And Rowan raises an eyebrow. Boy bands, fan fiction, soap operas, reality TV, most shows and movies of female main characters were still so rarely front and center, even rarer when you consider race and sexuality. And then when we do get something that's just for us, we're made to feel bad for liking it. We can't win. His expression turned sheepish. I've never thought about it that way. Neil McNair admitting I'm right. Another surreal moment. Yes, Rowan. This is a very surreal moment because you are the protagonist of a very unrealistically written novel because I could never imagine this conversation taking place between real people. In the novel that I do end up writing, even if it never gets published, I will strive to write dialogue that sounds like real people could speak it, especially real teenagers if I'm writing YA. I was friends with a lot of boys, classmates with, had lots of interactions and dialogue with teen boys in high school, in part because of my involvement in the elite choirs of the school, which were co-ed. So I spent a lot of time around teen boys and no, I'm sorry, I'm not buying this. Not even in 2020. If a girl info dumped that on you, you'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Even some of the more passive guys that I've known, I'm pretty sure would still kind of just be like, okay. <laughs> like, I don't think they'd be like, I've never thought about it that way, huh? And here with this next interaction, we cement the fact that this main character has no sense of humor and no ability to playfully interact with another human being who has no ill intent toward them. So they're going to the library to return these books that she forgot to return. McNair actually has the keys, but he's letting her think that they're gonna break in. And she says, I can add this to the list of my sentimental late night Westview memories. Right after hooking up with Luke Barrows for the first time in his car, parked right around there, I point across the street. He mock gasps. Rowan Roth, I thought you were a good girl. That stops me in my tracks. I am, I say, extremely aware of the thud of my heartbeat, but that doesn't mean I'm a virgin. Oh, I didn't mean, because you assumed good girls, girls like me who get straight A's, don't have sex. I mean, she's playing into the idea that good girls are the ones that get straight A's and girls that don't get straight A's aren't good girls. I mean, how academically normative of her or something. My voice is a little too hard edged, but I can't help it. He he fell right into something I happened to feel particularly strongly about. I don't know what's messing with my head more, wondering what Neil might have meant or that we're now officially talking about sex. You realize how wrong and outdated that is, right? Good girls aren't supposed to have sex, but if they don't, they're prudes, and if they do, they're sluts. And of course, none of that takes the spectrum of gender or sexuality into account. Things are starting to change slowly in italics, but the fact is, it's still completely different for guys. I cannot even with this chick. You're like finally getting along with this guy. You guys are vibing. You found out that he was Jewish and you bonded over that. You guys are on track to win this competition. That's all fun and cool. And he makes an offhand comment. He mock gasps by her own description, meaning he wasn't really like judging her. He was just like poking at her. But no, he's not allowed to do that. This man, this 
misogynist? How dare you even joke about that? How dare you display a sense of humor, which is a crime in this world, don't you know? And then she's on this monologue again. If I was this guy, I'd just be standing there like, okay. And then when she was done ranting, I'd be like, forget I said anything and just move on. And then she'd probably corner me with another rant and I'd have to be like, leave me alone. I'll never speak to you again. Why don't you just cut out my tongue and be done with it? Speaking of tongues, the book continues in the scene. Neil chokes on what I assume is his tongue, his wide eyes indicating he had no idea this is where the conversation was going. I knew where this conversation was going because I've been reading this book in which you are the main character, but this poor unsuspecting figure fictional boy. He didn't have access to the godlike information that I do. I wouldn't know, he says, clearly making every effort not to meet my gaze. Seeing as I've never, you know. Oh my god, he can't even say the word. Had sex, I say, and he nods. So she's now learned he's a virgin. We start walking again. A few years ago, I'd have been utterly embarrassed by this conversation. While my friends and I have had these kinds of discussions, Kirby won't miss an opportunity to rail on the patriarchy because we didn't have anyone mentioning the patriarchy yet. So if any of you had patriarchy on your woke bingo card, now is the time to check it off or take a drink or whatever you're doing. So he kind of wants confirmation from her that she's had sex. And she says, yeah, with Spencer and Luke, I appreciate that he doesn't have a dramatic reaction to this because he's woke now. I don't know why it should be embarrassing when so many of us think about it so often. And yet it's especially taboo for girls to talk about it. Back to her inner monologue. This is another reason I love romance novels. The way they attempt to normalize these conversations, not saying the world would be better if more people read romance novels, but well, yeah, I am. And then out loud she says, masturbation is the worst double standard. And he gets all embarrassed and red-faced and says, I'm familiar with the topic. I snort. I'm sure you are. It's just assumed that guys do it. So much so that guys can even joke about it. But for girls, it sometimes still feels like this dirty thing we're not supposed to talk about, even though it's perfectly healthy and plenty of us do it. Like, how is this a conversation? This is never a conversation that's been had between any two people except an adult feminist, probably, and her unsuspecting male conversational partner probably some guy she cornered at a party and he's like signaling with his eyes desperately to his friends across the room like come interrupt and save me or because he's a man and doesn't care so much about those kinds of things he's just like I have to pee or I need another drink and just walks away literally this is just the author being like these are the points that I want to convey I will have the characters say them again may I remind you that these characters are on this scavenger hunt slash assassin game that they're trying to win and and at this point, there's even more at stake because Rowan has learned about McNair's dad being in prison and how he could use the money, yada, yada. They are taking this detour to the library to return her books. Okay, fine. But then they're stopped outside of the library having this entire conversation of which I selectively read to you because there's more of it. Like the blocking for this scene is just them standing like outside the school library, all of a sudden having a conversation about the feminist worldview, about how women in current year are oppressed because of all the things and the shame and we can't talk about masturbation and let me explain all this to you. Okay, can we like return the books? Or like, could you take a joke? That would be great. So then they're in the library and they're sitting close together on the floor, leaning against a bookshelf and having this like sharing of feelings kind of conversation. And there's this part in her inner monologue where she goes, I lean back against my stack of books, feeling less comforted by the biography of incredible women quite literally backing me up than I thought I might. Like, why? Why? Where is the girl that thinks this in their head. I want to meet her and sit her down for pancakes and try to understand. And then like I mentioned earlier, there's the smacking down of the anti-Semite girl. This is after they've won the competition because of course they did. And Rowan says to Neil, hey, you know what I'm craving? Bowling alley pizza, like at Hilltop. Do you think they have any pizza here? And the girl who made the anti-Semitic remark says, you had the pizza at Hilltop Bowl? And Rowan says, no, but I know you did. With that, I meet her gay unblinking and I bring up my right index finger to tap my nose once twice her face flushes and it immediately becomes clear she knows what I'm talking about Neil catches on I'm Jewish too his hand drifts to my back and this might sound odd to you but that money's actually going to make a big difference for me I really really like him that's great the girl says and then she 
disappears into the crowd. That moment just lands so flatly because it's like, basically the way they paint this is she really had no connection to this girl. Like she didn't even realize that this girl was harboring so much resentment against her and McNair for always being number one and number two and never leaving room for anyone else. So she's like blindsided by that. She has no friendship with this girl, no rivalry with this girl. And this girl, you know, makes this comment that kind of burns her and like, I get it. But that happens so early on in the book and the only reason you even remember it is because then she like brings it up to McNair later and then all of a sudden at the end of the book you've already had the climax of the book they had like this whole misunderstanding where they were getting really really close and they kind of pull away and then she has to correct the misunderstanding and they finally kiss and it's amazing and they win the competition and yada 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 and oh I guess we have to like smack down this girl for that anti-semitic remark at the end there okay just to like bookend it, but I was just like, this is not integral to the plot. She had these friend characters that could have been fleshed out, but weren't. There was way more interactions that I felt were like not finished between her and her friends, but no, we had to make space for those scenes. Anyway, so that was this book, Today, Tonight, Tomorrow by Rachel Lynn Solomon. So now I'm gonna go check my list of books to read and make sure that I did not put any other YA books from her on the list because if this this is what I can expect from her books, then I am not interested. I'm sure this book will age well. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's not like this book is like really high quality and then it was just ruined by like some of these lines. These lines and sections, whole conversations, you know, monologues are the reason why this book is so bad in my opinion. Because like I said, I was primed to like this book. It has all these tropes that I love, but the author just spends too much time on like, like using her character as a way to convey a message instead of writing a story and letting the story convey the message. Because when I look back on the book and I'm like, okay, what was the book about? Or like, what was the point of it? I guess that you think you know someone, but you really don't, you know, don't judge people based on like this one thing or whatever. But the characters just didn't feel real. They were like these characters she was like building out as she went along. Oh, that's one thing I didn't talk about was like their sex scene. I remember being a teenage girl. Even when I was like in college, I'm trying to imagine like my inner monologue being like this and I'm like I guess it's trying to be like a romance novel or whatever but even for having slept with like two guys, like she's still in high school, like the way she expresses her sexuality and her inner monologue just reads much more like some sort of author self-insert. But the one thing I want to note from their sex scene was that when he slips his hand between her legs and strokes the inside of her thigh up and up, he asks asks, would this be okay? Because, you know, modern consent culture, we have to ask with our words. We can't just, you know, feel our way through things and respond to body language because somehow in the modern world, we have lost track of the ability to respond to body language. And she says, yes, yes. And so all is well in the world. They have signed the verbal consent contract and sex is had. Oh no, there was one more thing I wanted to point out in the sex scene. So right before they actually do it. She checks to make sure because she feels like they're kind of rushing into things and she's ready because, you know, she's the sexually experienced one in this scenario and she doesn't want to like go too far for his comfort or whatever. And he's just like, yo, he's like ready to go. And he conveys that he's nervous because he's afraid to like, you know, mess it up and that she won't want to have sex again. And she says, I'm nervous too. Excited, but nervous. And that's normal. That's why we'll talk to each other. We've always been good at that, right? The first time with someone is usually imperfect. That's part of what makes it fun. Figuring out together how to make it good. And I'm just like, can I get a character to talk like 70% of a real person? I'm not even asking for a hundred percent. I know they're not real, but like we're trying to go for realism, right? I mean, it's a contemporary YA. This isn't like a fantasy novel where maybe this culture talks in some stilted way and info dumping is part of their culture or something. This isn't even info dumping. It's like she's explaining it to him like she's his sex ed teacher or something. Like it's so weird weird and off-putting to me. So I'm looking at Goodreads and this book has actually got a decent rating. It's 4.23 out of 5 and most people have rated this book like pretty well and I don't see too many complaints but I did find one two-star review and I think this chick is on my train. She gives it two stars and says this should have been a slam dunk for me. Enemies to love, Seattle setting, and a YA rom-com. As it stands I'm having a hard time finding things I really liked. Mostly it was mediocre to frustrating for me. I was immediately bothered by the personality and attitude of the heroine. This review
reviewer went on to say, Beyond Rowan's characterization, there were too many agendas for one book, and rather than inspiring, it felt forced and conspicuous. Below are examples of the many social agendas presented one or multiple times throughout the book. Jewish stereotyping slash anti-Semitism, feminism, romance novel stereotyping, veganism, marijuana legality, gender equality, sex positivity. Yeah, I didn't even go into the scene where they go and get edibles. Alone or subtly explored, I can enjoy social issues being addressed in romantic fiction, but in this book, I was overwhelmed with constantly being told about them rather than shown. It also didn't help that I wasn't a big fan of the protagonist and had to endure her numerous expositions on various topics. Yeah, one of the things that she points out here is something I should mention. Part of the other reason that these in-your-face kind of like messages are so annoying is because this is not just a book that happens to have romance in it. The entire structure of this book is one of a romance novel and therefore it has certain things that it needs to deliver. It's supposed to like make you feel that comfortable and safe kind of like feeling. Like you can address a social issue in a romance novel, but you gotta like kind of pick one because otherwise you're too scattered and that's what's constantly in your face instead of like the relationship that's supposed to be building. Like that is the core of the book. In a romance novel, the romance is the plot. Without the romance, you don't have the plot of the book. You don't have a book. Having all these conversations where they're just standing there talking about stereotypes about women and sex or media and this and that and constantly being like, OMG, can we get back to the plot? Like seriously, can we develop this relationship some more? So like maybe I find you less annoying and I actually care about the two of you getting together. So anyway, that is the end of my rant about this book. I do have a few scripts in the works and I plan to be recording some videos soon related to the heroine's journey. And I also should be doing a video about a liberal reformer soon and possibly one about the red pill as in the red pill community, not like taking the red pill because a subscriber subscriber asked me about it. And I would also like to talk about science fiction and fantasy publishing that is still coming. And I really want to dig into doing videos about the feminine mystique, the scum manifesto, and the manipulated man. And I look forward to bringing you that content. So stay tuned and I thank you for your patience. Feel free to comment below, DM me on Twitter, send me an email, let me know your thoughts. I always read them even if I do not always respond. Your comments are all up here, I promise. Thank you all for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe and I will have more content for you very soon.